one of the premier interpreters of popular music, his career took off after the success of his one-man Broadway show. From being Ira Gershwin's assistant to recording over 20 albums, winning multiple Grammy Awards, and owning his own New York showroom at the Regency Hotel, he has proven he's more than merely a performer. He's also nationally recognized for his commitment to the American popular song, celebrating its art and preserving its legacy for the next generation. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up next on Interviews, our conversation with stellar performer and musical historian Michael Feinstein. In your own opinion, what do you think makes a song a classic? Longevity. Longevity makes a song a classic. The fact that people want to hear it over and over again, want to perform it over and over again. The thing that makes a good song is the perfect combination of words and music. If one element is weaker than the other, then it's not going to be a successful song. Now, I read somewhere that you said or made comment to the fact that you can see that. You can see that in a song when you look at it. What is it that you're noticing? What makes them come together so well? It's interesting that uh, a song that is a good song has a certain sort of um, a feeling that it had to turn out that way. In other words, it is a feeling of inevitability in that where it goes feels so natural, so right. And of course, the writer sometimes makes slave forever to get to that feeling. It's called deceptive simplicity. But I look for something that expresses its ideas clearly without being too clever, yet contains surprises in it. Yeah. How long have you been in love with music? Music has always been a very important part of my life. Was it Beethoven who said, without music, life would be a mistake? One of those great guys. I have uh, been exposed to music from the time I was in my mother's womb because they my parents were both uh, very musical, and so I was surrounded by music, and the, our extended family would get together and sing at all the, the gatherings that we had. So uh, it was complete immersion in music, and that's why I do what I do, because basically I can't do anything else, so I'm very lucky. <laughs> Have you ever felt a slave, though, to music? Have you ever wanted to escape it? I don't want to escape music itself. Sometimes aspects of my career that sometimes seem to get in the way of just the pure enjoyment of the music can be daunting. But music itself is, is wonderful. I, I find that when I'm not performing, I'm listening to music. There's so many infinite varieties and possibilities that I always love uh, being able to be exposed to something that's new or fresh. I read a quote you said somewhere about, if you were to sit down now from this point forward and listen to everything you own musically, records, you wouldn't be able to get through them in your life, that you have such that's a large true. collection. I have thousands and thousands of records and digital audio tapes and cassettes and 16-inch transcription discs and other formats, reel-to-reel tapes. I have collected a lot of material uh, archives that I have sort of inherited, uh, 10 boxes of tapes of Bing Crosby radio shows, sorts of things that uh, I may, well, certainly I will never get to listen to. But I'm cataloging all of it and preserving as much of it as I can and transferring the fragile things to more stable uh, media, and it will all eventually go to the Library of Congress. So then do you do it still for the enjoyment of it? Why do you take all this time to catalog all this stuff? Is it for the history of it or for something for you personally? I have a great sense of preservation. It's always been very important to me. I'm, I'm not sure why, but there are so many things that have disappeared in our world, especially connected to the arts. Yeah. And I have a lot of unique and rare things that I don't want to see disappear. And because of that, I do have an obsession about preserving and trying to find things that are in danger of, uh, of uh, becoming endangered species, if you will. There, there is so much that has been lost through the years, and I've seen it in my lifetime. And so it is sort of a mission. I hate that word because it sounds so uh, uh, serious, but there is certainly uh, a great feeling of urgency to do as much as I can. Is there that holy grail you're searching for out there, something you've been looking for for years that you haven't found yet? There are so many things that are lost that I would love to find, especially in the world of radio broadcasts from the 30s. 
George Gershwin made many appearances on radio that are long gone, yet I still have hope that something might turn up. He did demonstration recordings when he went to Hollywood in 1930 to work on his first film musical. It was a movie called Delicious, and it wasn't. <laughs> but uh, he hired a young, uh, relatively unknown singer named Bing Crosby to sing his demos. And to have been able to hear George Gershwin and Bing Crosby would have been wonderful. And I spent years looking for those things, and they, they have not yet turned up. Do you, do you think they will? Are, do you know? Are you on a path right now? Have you got some hint that where they might be found? Or no? I've looked every logical place, but in Hollywood, sometimes things turn up in a garage or a basement or at a, at a, uh, state, an estate sale. Uh, two months ago, a friend of mine was at a uh, sale in downtown Los Angeles of unclaimed property and found several boxes of recordings that had belonged to Judy Garland and Vincent Minnelli when they were married to each other. And they're clearly identified as as such. Once you look at them, you see that they were theirs. And I don't know where they came from, where they've been all these years, but there they were. Wow. Now, if I understand the story, when you were a kid, this all started. Your dad would give you a dollar and you would go to the Salvation Army or one of those kind of stores and go through the bins looking for stuff? It's true. I was five years old, and he would take me to Goodwill Industries, and I could buy 20 78s for a dollar. And I didn't even know what they were, but I just started picking them out. And I've always had this obsession with uh, recorded sound. It's amazing to me that something can be recorded 80 years ago, and you just put the needle on the disc, and suddenly you're hearing that moment in time again, recaptured. Somebody had said to me once that you can never listen to music off a recording because all you're hearing is an electronic interpretation of the music and the only true way to hear music is to hear it performed live. How do you feel about that? I think that music exists in many different forms and one of the great things especially about early recording is that it was simple. There was no technology to get in the way of the capturing of it. There was no multi-tracking or other devices that are common that make it more impersonal now. But what I hear when I listen to a recording made in 1925 is truly a a rendering of that moment. It's the microphone capturing what was there, even though it is from the perspective of that microphone. Nevertheless, there's no overdubbing or someone saying, oh, gee, I can sing that note better, or let's fix this, or we need to change that, or let's edit. None of that. So it's it's honest, and it's live, and it's it's amazing, because the level of musicianship then was, I think, in many ways superior, because technology is the, the blessing and is also the curse. Yeah, yeah. When you record something, how much of it is get it done, the first take as much as live, or has technology interfered with you too? I love performing live. I primarily uh, am a live performer, and therefore when I make records, I can do them very quickly. And so most of the time I try and do it live, but there are times when because of a schedule, uh, we have to do the, the piano track, or we have to do this or that, and it's assembled. But... Uh, then I treat it as a recording as opposed to a live thing. It's different. It's different in what it's going to come out to be. And then I start playing with the technology. Uh, but I have done live recordings, and, and those I prefer because they have a certain kind of energy to them that are, that are different from the studio recordings. Yeah. You started playing when? How old were you? Five years old. And when did you start performing professionally? I started playing professionally sometime in my teens, my early teens, I had been playing the piano by ear, and I was uh, quite accomplished, especially for not reading music and just sort of doing what I do. I played with both hands when I sat down. I just knew how to play the piano. I understood how to get the sounds out of that that box and those 88 teeth glaring at me. (laughs) But I was offered $25 to play for a wedding, and I couldn't believe somebody would pay me $25 (laughs) to play the piano. It was amazing. And then I started getting jobs playing the piano and I never stopped. I got out of high school. I I didn't go to college. I started playing in piano bars. I worked for a while as a dance accompanist at Ohio State University. Uh, I was living in Columbus, Ohio. Age 20, I moved to Los Angeles. I started playing in piano bars and then I met Ira Gershwin and uh, spent six years with him. But everything is, is, is a result of my desire to become immersed in music, either by performing it or by learning about it, everything that has happened. I heard somewhere also that you had actually met a fortune teller, somewhere along the line that told you what was going to happen in your life, and it was, turned out to be pretty accurate. Is that a true story? I met a psychic. I was working at a restaurant called Mother's in the San Fernando Valley, 
And the guy who ran the place was a Humphrey Bogart character. You're never going to go anywhere. You're, you're, <laughs> you're nothing. You're, I mean, he said words much stronger than that. And one of the waitresses at the restaurant said, oh, I know this great psychic. Her name is Carol Dreyer, and you should go see her. So I went to see her, and she told me that I would be working for Ira Gershwin. She told me that I would have a career as a performer that would, that would be performing old music. And most of what she said did happen. So she said Ira Gershwin directly. She said it wasn't Ira just Gershwin. some classic person. She said Ira Gershwin, and I had met June Levant, who knew Ira Gershwin, June Levant being the widow of a, of a great wit and a pianist, Oscar Levant, who is unfortunately not very well remembered today. But this psychic named Ira Gershwin, and that was extraordinary to me because how could she come up with that? I, there, I wasn't anybody that she would have been able yeah. to, to track at that point. Do you believe then in, in psychics and all of that? I do. I believe. I, mean, that, I can understand with a story like that. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that there's a lot of uh, fakes out there and a lot of people who think that they are gifted who are not. And ultimately, I believe that we all have the innate ability within ourselves and don't have to go to other people for it, even though there are others to help us along. But certainly in my own life, I've had the experience of finding so many odd things that I never thought I would find. And I started to learn that if I really focused on something and visualized it, in many instances, I could manifest it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the Ira Gershwin time. That must have been amazing for you. Meeting Ira Gershwin was certainly the most significant experience of my life. He was 80 years old when I met him. I was 20. I had been living in Los Angeles for less than a year and had, and had moved there because of a very strong impulse that that was where I should be, even though, in retrospect, it makes sense that I would have gone to New York since I was playing the piano and singing and doing a lot of New York-type show tunes, if you will. But I had this whole series of, quote, coincidences where I met June Levant by going into a record store and buying some records that belonged to her husband that she didn't know had been carried out of her house. It was all these strange permutations that ultimately led me to meeting Ira Gershwin. I had been obsessed with Gershwin music from the time I was quite young, and so when I met Ira, it was as if I had been preparing for that moment through most of my life, and suddenly everything fell into place. And I spent these six years first as his discographer, putting his record collection together, and then I became his companion and his assistant and his eyes and ears to the outside world. And he eventually named me as his literary executor of his estate because our relationship became so close and he knew that I cared so deeply about his work and the perpetuation of it. Can you remember the first moment meeting him, though? Do you still remember the feeling of that? I remember very clearly my first meeting with Ira because I was so nervous, and Mrs. Gershwin, uh, Lee was her name, she pulled into the driveway just as I was arriving, so she greeted me and opened the door to the house, and as the door swung open, I saw this man sitting there whom I'd only seen in pictures, and uh, he... Uh, said hello, and he said, pardon me for not getting up, because he was sedentary. He couldn't stand up on his own. And he was autographing a record album uh, that was made up of home recordings of of Iris singing that were put out uh, against his wishes. He didn't want these sort of bad recordings to go out because he didn't like his own voice. But anyway, this album came out, and I said, I have that record. And he looked (laughs) at me, and he said, you have that record? I said, yes. He said, well, what do you think of it? I said, well, I like it. He said, you like it? He said, you're the first person outside of friends or relatives I've met who actually bought that record. And uh, then to make conversation, I said, Mr. Gershwin, I have an old 78 of Gershwin songs from from La La Lucille from, from 1920. And Iris said, oh, well, that probably would have been the two most popular songs from the show, Nobody But You and Teotolumbumbo. I said, that's right. And Lee Gershwin turned to her sister, who was also sitting there. She said, isn't that cute? He's telling Ira that's right. (laughs) So our relationship immediately began in an unusual way because Ira realized that I was this kid who knew a lot about his work. So suddenly he was paying attention to me in a way that he hadn't paid attention to other people of my generation. You must have felt so tall when you walked out of that room after that. I I couldn't believe the experience. I, I was absolutely thrilled because... It was a validation of what was important to me. Yeah. Did he encourage your musical career? Did he know what else you wanted to do besides just being someone to work with his stuff? Ira did encourage me as a performer, even though 
I hadn't really developed enough to the point where I was proud of what I was doing then. But he was very gentle. He was a very sweet soul and always very nurturing. And so he absolutely guided me in interpreting his songs and teaching me fundamental things that I didn't know and probably wouldn't have learned for a long time if it hadn't been for his uh, uh, mentoring. Yeah. And your neighbor was Rosemary Clooney. Is that true? Rosemary Clooney lived next door to Ira Gershwin, and I lived at the Gershwin house for a while, and Rosemary was my favorite female singer, and eventually I got to meet her through uh, Mrs. Gershwin, who made me march next door to complain that they weren't taking care of their cats. Uh, It wasn't my job, but I did it, and uh, Rosemary uh, immediately became like my second mom. She actually called herself my Beverly Hills mother. <laughs> uh, the feelings that you had back then when you met those kind of people, do you still get those thrills today meeting certain celebrities, or is it all old hat now? My favorite people are songwriters and orchestrators and musicians. I still am tongue-tied when I'm around them or I'm most impressed by them because what they have created and what they have given us is an extraordinary legacy. I consider music to be healing and extraordinarily important in our world. I think that the education of children with music is essential uh, to our growth, and uh, therefore it is meeting the creators that is uh, most important. Meeting a, a, a performer or an actress, I, I, I don't care. I don't care about Paris Hilton. You, know, <laughs> you I don't? don't? I don't? I don't care about, uh, uh, well, I'm not going to name other names, but the point is that um, I, I don't get it. I, it's like I live on Mars when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I don't... It, it eludes me. <laughs> when you surround yourself with such a great catalog of music, and you talk about all the great songs, when it comes time for you to sit down and write your own stuff, is it intimidating? Is it harder to break through that and say, who am I to write against all of this, or are you okay with that? For years, I was intimidated about uh, writing my own music, and I met Yip Harburg uh, years ago, who was a classmate of Ira Gershwin's. Yip wrote Over the Rainbow in April in Paris, and the whole score of Wizard of Oz. And he said, do you write music? I said, yes, but I'm shy about playing it for people. He said, well, that might get in the way of your career. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, it did. It did in that aspect of it. But I'm starting to write more now. How do you get past it? Do you have to sit there and say, you know what, my stuff is okay. I can validate myself, or does it come to you from outside sources? How do you know? It's not judging it and leaving it alone, writing something, and then going back to it later. Because in the moment, I said, oh, that sounds like that, that sounds like that. There are only 12 notes in the scale, and so it's writing it and not judging it, just turning off that part and putting it down and then going back to it later. That's how I have to do it. Now, another person that came into your life that helped this career move along, Liza Minnelli. Yes, Liza Minnelli was and is a very important part of my life. I met Liza through her father, Vincent Minnelli, who was close friends with Ira and Lee Gershwin. Uh, Ira Gershwin was best man at the wedding of Vincent Minnelli and Judy Garland, and Liza was named after the Gershwin song Liza and was Ira's goddaughter. So when I met Liza after knowing her father for so many years, it was like meeting a long-lost cousin. And uh, we've been, in her words, joined at the hip ever since. (laughs) But she helped you get your first show, correct, in New York? Liza gave me my first publicity in L.A. through a huge party for me and then hosted my opening at the Algonquin and hosted uh, my opening when I created my own nightclub, Feinstein's at the Regency. She was there. She has always been there as a supporter, and she has always done remarkably generous things for me. At what point did you realize for yourself that you had stepped out of the shadows of all your fav- famous friends mm. and now were actually someone in your own right on the, the public scale? The first time I really had a sense that I was going to be able to make a great living out of what I was doing and that I had reached other people without uh, qualification, if you will, was when I made my New York debut. That was most exciting when I suddenly was written up in the New York Times, and I didn't have a sense of what any, what any of that was about, except suddenly I was catapulted into a limelight that uh, has never receded. And so it is because of going to New York and having those breaks, thanks to Liza and Ira and all the people who prepared me for it, that I am talking to you right now. What do you think it is you contribute to the scene? The music that I perform is very important to me because it captures a very important time in our world that was filled with extraordinary eloquence of music and of lyrics. And I feel it's important to keep that 
time alive through the music because the songs are timeless in the same way that Shakespeare is timeless or Picasso or any great work of art. And so I try to present these songs in a way that is not clinical, that is first and foremost entertaining, but brings through the essence of the beauty of what these writers created. Because the great thing about being alive today is that we have everything that came before as well as all the imagination and technology of our time. Is there certain popular music artists that you listen to outside of this whole catalog? I'm always discovering voices that intrigue me, and I have very eclectic tastes. I mean, I'll listen to to Willie Nelson, and uh, I'll, I'll listen to uh, a lot of classic things. Of, of contemporary singers, uh, there are a lot of talented people out there, uh, yet I tend to gravitate to the older interpretations because there is something pure about them that I don't hear as often today. Yeah. I want to take you to one of your albums I'm on to make sure we don't run out of time and don't talk about. You're recording with the Israeli Philharmonic. Working with the Israel Philharmonic was quite an amazing experience because as often as I've worked with symphonies, I had never made an album with a symphony orchestra. And to work with one of the greatest in the world, it was... uh, quite daunting. I was really on my mettle because these musicians treated my orchestrations of American popular songs with the same serious mindedness as they would have uh, uh, approached Gershwin or, uh, or Beethoven, or Bach, uh, Mozart. I mean, they, they had no snobbism about the music, which I find does happen here in this country with symphonies. And also, living in Israel, these musicians played as if their lives depended on it because they do. I was going to say the political situation, to go into something like that, and I don't know, having never been there myself, but from everything you hear, to try and then sit down and do something artistic in the middle of all of this, is that really how you feel in the moment that you're there, or does the work supersede it all? Making music in Israel, I always had a sense of where I was and the situation going going on there, uh, because unlike the residents, I was sometimes uh, a bit on edge, worried, uh, where everyone there was saying, well, you see very little violence. It's not something that we see. You you read about as you do here, you know, but they don't see it firsthand. And uh, so I was uh, was nervous at at times. But then when I was doing the music, uh, I was uh, uh, transposed to another experience because, for example, singing somewhere singing the words, we'll find a new way of living, we'll find a way of forgiving in that country, knowing that Leonard Bernstein had conducted the orchestra and singing his song. Suddenly, that song took on a resonance that moved me to a place that I hadn't dreamed uh, could have happened before I went there. Yeah. With all of the background that you have in the music, can you ever just free yourself from a song and enjoy it in the moment, or is there always all of this with it for you? I think that as an artist, I have to get to the place of being free and just uh, experiencing the feeling and the essence of the song. When I introduce a song, I always like to put it in a context. It's always entertaining. I find fun anecdotes to tell. But putting the song in a context makes it more resonant for the audience. And my goal is to absolutely uh, be one with the material in a way that, that supersedes the ego. And that's not easy, especially for me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and why I ask that is I think that often when we study so much of something and we get so involved in it that maybe at times we can lose the sheer joy that skims the surface of something Mm. when you know so much that you know about something. And I wonder how you balance that off for yourself and does all of that ever alter the way you perform a song, take you to a different place intentionally or unintentionally? The music absolutely takes me to where it's going to take me, and that can be different every time I perform it. I was with Ira Gershwin one day, and he was talking about a song lyric he wrote, and the last line was, Just, oh, just make love. And the way it came out, it was like, let's do the sexual act. And I said to Ira, that's unlike you to have written that kind of a lyric. And he was exasperated. He said, well, that's just where it took me. I didn't have any choice. That's just where it went. And I understand what he meant. That's where it went, and that's what happens in performing. It just goes where it's going to go, and that's the thrill of it, that it's always fresh because it is happening in the moment. And that's the excitement of live performance because that is absolutely crackling with, with uh, spontaneity, and it will never exactly be like that again. Do you like owning your own club? 
I love having my own club. Feinstein's at the Regency has been a great blessing for me because I have a home in New York that's an intimate place, and I also play Carnegie Hall every other year. So I have the balance of doing both of those things. And I also have been able to bring people into the club who normally don't play a smaller setting. Uh, people like uh, Jimmy Webb or Linda Etter or Cleo Lane or uh, great, great stars who want to be there because they choose to be in an intimate setting for the closeness of the contact with the audience and having the experience of the people being able to see the whites of your eyes and yeah. to really experience the, the honesty of it. Is Cabaret dying today? People always say Cabaret is dying just as they say the theater is always dying. And it does limp along, but I don't think it will ever die because I think it will always have an important place, even though uh, it, it, it's hard. But I don't think it will ever die. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the work you do to keep it alive. Well, and thank you. It's a pleasure I... to sit down with you today. This was fun. This was, you mean it's over? It's over. That was it. <laughs> it was that quick. Michael Feinstein. transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. 